Hi, um, welcome to my brief talk on folk, my folk tale research. Um, when most people think about archaeology, they tend to focus more on the material, the pots, the pans, the houses, the food. But the immaterial can give so much more insight into the lives of ancient people and how they viewed the world around them, which is very important. For example, about a year or so ago, I was reading about this creature on your screen. Uh, it's called a lindworm from Norse mythology. They were known for their magic, their poisonous breath, and to sometimes be born to human queens and transform into handsome princes when they shed enough of their skin. So as I was reading about this creature, I was very confused about how such a thing could, you know, perpetuate itself in the narrative. What drives the transmission of such creatures? So um, now that the introduction of that is out of the way, we've got to do a bit of housekeeping. So what is a folk tale? Um, there's been many definitions of folk tales in the past, but I used one from Fisher in 1963 as a definition of my project. Uh, folk tales as a whole can be broadly defined as any narrative, dramatic or oral, including serious myths dealing with the supernatural or as tales told primarily for entertainment or moralizing purposes. Now that's out of the way. So I go back to my original idea from the lindworm. What drives the spread of folk tales? There have been many ideas, such as the couching of moral and social norms uh, for each society in folk tales, and, um, so, and historical retellings. But the one I decided to investigate more closely was minimally counterintuitive or MCI elements. MCI elements are simply counterintuitive things that violate ontology and schema in li a limited or one way, like a rock that floats on water. Um, it doesn't really include things that, you know, animals that talk and live forever and walk on two legs. That's not a minimally counterintuitive element. That is a maximally counterintuitive element. Um, many studies, including the two that I have on the screen there, have proven a connection between MCI and the MCIs and the increased memorability of narratives. Although I say proven, it's not quite proven. Um, it is like still quite heavily debated in the discipline of cultural evolution. So that led me on to a quite simple hypothesis. Uh, the number of MCI elements in a folk tale impacts the spread of that particular tale. So that's what I set out to test. Um, I set out to test this in this particular way. So folk tales, uh, like the one above, I drew from something called the Arn Thompson Uther Index, which is a codex of Eurasian folk tales that includes over a thousand. Um, and many different tale types, so tales of animals and tales of magic that occurred within them. Um, and, the, and so I took a sample of 52 randomly selected folk tales from a paper um, called from Bortoloni et al, which had did some research on folk tale appearance. It had a total population of 520 folk tales and 21 languages which ranged for, geographically from the UK to uh, the Middle East. For each folk tale in this set, it was recorded how many languages they appeared in or the language frequency. So as the storylines were drawn from the index, the number of MCI elements was plotted against the language frequency. And uh, as you can see above in the tale, A Land Where No One Dies, um, this is how I categorized um, MCI elements. So you see, uh, I pointed out here, a land where no one dies. That's counterintuitive, everyone dies. Um, and even though death is personified in many different uh, retellings, the Grim Reaper, Hades, uh, so on and so forth, um, death doesn't often look for people. Death sort of just, death happens and death happens at a pre-prescribed time in many different folk tales, but death actively looks for this person. So I define this as a counterintuitive thing. 
This particular folktale appeared in about six languages, including Bi Bulgarian and Belarusian, and so therefore it was plotted two MCI elements against six languages. Now, this was done for all 52 folktales. Uh, However, this is quite a shallow analysis, so in attempt to deepen it, I included two more variables. Um, the appearance in number of language clades and distance and distance. Language clades um, were drawn from uh, Indo-European language phylogeny, and this included the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, and the Cyrillic languages. Uh, a folk tale that appeared in more clades was more highly weighted in the analysis than one that appeared only a few. So, for example, a folk tale that appeared in two languages from two separate clades um, was more highly weighted than one that appeared for, in two languages or three languages from the same clade. The distance variable was slightly more tricky to create because it was based on the putative origin points of languages. And now the putative origin points of languages are slightly difficult to ascertain. So I used capital cities. So for each language the folktale appeared in, the, la the distance between each of these putative origin points was added up. So languages from two, from two or more, so on and so forth, spatially distance points were weighted more highly than those from close points. So for example, a folktale that appeared in Spanish, Portuguese and French was less highly weighted than one that appeared in Russian, uh, Turkish and English. Both of, these, both of these factors were then also plotted against MCI count. Um, I then also conducted statistical analyses like regression analyses and Spearman's row to ensure statistical significance and that my model and the ideas that I had were actually borne out by the facts. So this leads on to the more interesting part of um, the more interesting than my methodology is my results. So my results were actually quite simple in a way. Um, it showed that the number of MCI elements had a very strong positive correlation with the frequency of appearance in languages. This is not only true for the simpler one, but also for the different appearance in different language clades and over distance. Uh, overall, this suggests that the more MCI elements um, a folktale has, the greater it's spread both linguistically and geographically. Um, I will introduce a small limitation here. Um, I was the one selecting what MCI elements were. And whilst I made lots of attempts to like remain objective, it is true that what may be counterintuitive to me, like death looking for someone, is not counterintuitive to anybody else. However, I did make all possible attempts to remain objective. Um, I talked to various people in the field. I talked to Nora Zion. I talked to somebody called Upal, and he's a psychologist with the US Department of Defense, which was <laughs> kind of um, surreal talking to him. But he gave me a table of what he considered MCI elements, which was very interesting. But more later. Um, but what do these results actually mean? To go back to the lindworm, not only is it a very interesting creature by itself and counterintuitive in the fact that it turns into a handsome prince, it's also used in many historical retellings. Um, most famously with one of the most legendary Norse kings, which is kind of like, is he real? Is he mythical? Not really sure. Um, but Ragnar Lothbrok. So in a particular folktale, Ragnar Lothbrok um, defeats a lindworm and saves the daughter of a Jarl, who he subsequently marries. Now, it's quite clear that lindworms don't actually exist. So it's kind of the couching of a historical tale with a lindworm, which indicates that perhaps the presence of the lindworm 
but simply made it easier to remember, made, e made it easier to pass down this history to the next generation and spread it out across the culture. So this is so understanding um, understanding the evolution of MCI narratives is very important, not only for this, but in the study of the evolution of human psychology. This, this study is one rife with debates on how the structures of the mind, memory included, and perhaps memory especially, came to be. Understanding uh, whether MCI narratives in some way shaped human cognition or more likely exploited a facet of human cognition already present um, provides one more way to ask questions about the development of human memory and how histories and stories spread. Further, not only are these results interesting, but they can be added to a wider literature and debate in cultural evolutionary theory and folkloric research. Whilst they're not definitive, they do add to the idea that MCI elements are important and necessary for the memorability of narratives. Stories are in fact central to humanity. Whether you're telling a loved one about your day or about a singing grove of trees that can cure death, looking at folk tales gives a deep insight into what ancient people thought about the world around them but perhaps more importantly, how they remembered it. Yeah. Um, and oh, my image sources. These are very good books and you can kind of tell that I have favorites uh, among the mythology corpuses. 